Why is this couple smiling? Perhaps they found hope, meaning, and purpose in the Book of Revelation. Nearly 2,000 years ago, a lonely man on a distant island received a remarkable vision. Some readers have been frightened by his vision, but many more have found in it the hope, meaning, and purpose they were looking for. And now, here are your hosts, Dr. John Pauline and Dr. Graham Bradford. Hi, I'm John. And I'm Graham. And we want to welcome you to Revelation, Hope, Meaning, Purpose. Graham, we've come to a big part, the book of Revelation. How did we get here? <laughs> it's been a quite a journey, hasn't it? Yes, it has. We've been building, building a foundation, spent a lot of time in getting the Old Testament backgrounds, and now we're about to deal with Armageddon, a very popular subject. But before anyone deals with Armageddon, they should have a, a proper background. So for the sake of those who may be watching for the first time, we may just give a quick review as a lead up to Armageddon. Uh, we find that the covenant language is very strong in Revelation, the covenant. The covenant now has been expanded to include all those who, who believe in Jesus, regarding, regardless of race or country you live in, uh, originally made with the Jewish nation, but now is expanded to all the followers of Jesus. And that certainly affects the way we read the prophecies of Revelation, because Revelation takes those Old Testament promises once made to literal Israel, living in the land of Palestine, and now applies them to wherever God's people are. And where are God's people? In every nation, every country. But it's the language of the Old Testament to describe what is happening to the followers of Jesus or the church. The Bible goes back here, John goes back here, and takes the experiences of Israel as if God's people were still living in the land. So when we read the River Euphrates, we have to read it as Revelation itself will interpret it for us as being people. We read about Babylon and we find another form of Babylon, not the Babylon we find over in Iraq. And uh, we talk about, it talks about Jezebel. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a language of the Old Testament. When we had the nation of Israel living in the land, nations north, south, east and west were all affecting God's people. But now God's people are all over the world. So that's an important way in which we we read Revelation and affects the way we read Armageddon. Also central to the whole message is the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And so we're going to find that Armageddon is not just a battle of guns and tanks, but it is centering in keeping your relationship to Jesus. This is going to unfold as we go through. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, the text we're looking at today is the sixth plague. Mm -hmm. And this is found in Revelation 16 mm -hmm. and verses 12 through 16. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, Graham, if you could read those for sure, us. Sure, I'd be happy to. Mm -hmm. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. All right. Well, that word Armageddon is something we want to explore a little bit later. Mm -hmm. uh, but clearly it is located here in the book of Revelation as part of the seven plagues. Mm -hmm. But there's uh, a feature here that I think we need to talk about just briefly, and that is the concept I sometimes call the movie flashback. Uh, what sometimes happens uh, in movies and films is the idea that you, you portray a period in the life of the character, and then sometimes the character will get this sort of a, a glazed look in their eye, you know, <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the, the, the picture begins to shimmer a little bit, and suddenly you're back in childhood or you're back at some earlier uh, stage. And it is necessary for the viewer who doesn't know this person 
it is necessary for them to get the backstory in order to really understand what that person is experiencing at that point in time. Mm -hmm. This, I think, is what is going on here in chapter 16, verses 12 through 16. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people who read Revelation and don't pay attention to those kinds of moves in the book will misunderstand what is going on there. Mm -hmm. Let me just give you one other example. And if you don't mind, Graham, sure. uh, let me just take right your ahead. Bible. And in Revelation 16, 4, we're looking at the fourth bowl plague, excuse me, the third. The angel, third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Now, that's the third plague. And that occurs after the close of probation, after the temple is emptied, after people have stopped making decisions for or against uh, Jesus Christ, for or against the gospel. So it is very, very late in these events. But notice what follows. You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were, the Holy One, because you've judged for, verse 6, they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets. Now, when did that occur? Mm. That wasn't after the close of probation. Mm. At least most of it was not. Mm. This is a reference to the persecutions that have been occurring well before that in the working up toward the final crisis. Mm. So here you have the plague itself is turning the rivers and springs into blood, but then the explanation that follows includes reference back to things that happened before this. That's exactly what's happening here. Mm -hmm. What is the plague? in chapter 16, verse 12. Mm -hmm. It is that the bowl is poured out on the river Euphrates, and the river Euphrates is dried up. That's the plague. Mm -hmm. What follows verse 12 is one of these movie flashbacks. Mm -hmm. And you can see that when you look at it, because first of all, you have a reference in verse 13 to the dragon, the beast, the false prophet. Who are these guys? Mm -hmm. Same characters you had in chapter 12. Chapter 13, and they've been operating long before the end of time, mm. long before the close of probation. So these characters appear, and you see the buildup to the time of the seven last plagues, the time when the three frogs are still going out. We'll mm. talk more about that later, but the three frogs, the counterfeit gospel, is still going out to the world. So chapter 16, verses 13 through 15 is describing events that take place back in history that lead up to mm. the Battle of Armageddon. Mm. I would even say the Battle of Armageddon itself is not a point in time, mm -hmm. but it's rather a description of the entire conflict of the end times, which goes well back before the close of probation, mm -hmm. which actually includes the outgoing of the gospel, includes the rejection of the gospel, the hardening that we talked about in the previous program. And now, finally, when you get to the plagues themselves, uh, the whole world is completely divided into two camps. So as you're reading the sixth plague, Armageddon itself is not the plague. The plague is uh, falling on the river Euphrates. We'll understand better what that means in the next segment. That plague falls in the river Euphrates, it is dried up. That is the plague. Armageddon itself is part of the larger context that leads up to that plague. Mm -hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Sure. Very interesting, sure. Okay, and verse 15 tells us a very, to keep us on track, mm -hmm. lest we go off in wrong directions. Verse 15 gives us a very important central part of Armageddon. So let's look at verse 15. Mm -hmm. In Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15, it tells us here, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. So here is a reference here to, as you have pointed out earlier, uh, Laodicea. Laodicea is certainly in focus here, isn't it? The mm -hmm. person who has to get the garment to clothe themselves, language. And maybe the temple guards are in focus here mm -hmm. because if they were sleeping, they were mm -hmm. stripped naked to mm -hmm. shamefully expose them. <laughs> um, keeping your garments certainly has a lot to do with keeping your hope and trust in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people say, why study Revelation? Is it important? Why should I even bother? Hey, this verse tells us it is important, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Stay awake. Remain, you know, stay awake doesn't mean with a telescope watching, you know. <laughs> stay awake. Remain spiritually alive and alert. Watch out. You Christians who have the covering of Christ's righteousness, 
If you're not careful, you could be deceived by the events leading up to Armageddon. Study your Bible, follow the counsel of Jesus, understand what is happening in order to maintain your righteous hold, righteousness in Him and your hold upon Him. All right, we're going to have a break and follow on after the break. Welcome back. We're going to return now to Armageddon and we're going to read that text again of Revelation chapter 16 and verse 12, which talks about the Armageddon battle. So Revelation chapter 16 and verse 12 here says, The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. All right, we find here are some key elements coming out in this verse, and we're going to have them up before our viewers also. The key points coming out in Revelation 16, 12. First of all, there's the river Euphrates, and uh, it's drying up, and there are kings coming from the rising of the sun or the east where the sun rises, mm -hmm. and this is part of what is leading. This is the Armageddon, sure. I think okay. basically if you want to make sense of the Battle of Armageddon, you have to know what those three things are. Sure. You know, what's the Euphrates River? Mm -hmm. What is its drying up all about? Uh, yeah. Who are these kings from the east? That's, that's basically what we're going to be about in this segment. Because some people yeah. feel, well, it's River Euphrates drying up. It must be that river running over yeah. there in Iraq, you know? Yeah, well, and, and it, it is in a way yeah. because this text is building on the ancient context. There yeah. are ancient stories both in the Bible and outside the Bible about Babylon, about the Euphrates, about the drying up of the river and its fall. Uh -huh. You see, Babylon is in the middle of the desert. Mm -hmm. And as a result, rainfall is almost non-existent there. This is not far from Baghdad today, if people want to locate it a bit. That river that runs right through the middle of the city, it's kind of a twin city on either sides of the river. That river is critical for irrigation, it's critical for transportation. It's the lifeblood of Babylon. You dry up that river and Babylon doesn't have a great future. Mm -hmm. That's okay. the bottom line here. Right. Mm -hmm. So Babylon at one point did fall because of the drying up of the river. And uh, one of our scholars, uh, Dr. Bernard Taylor, uh, will come and tell us a little bit the story of the original Babylon's fall. Borrowing from Charles Dickens and the title of his novel, A Tale of Two Cities, the book of Revelation can be described as a tale of two cities, Jerusalem and Babylon. Babylon was an interesting power at the time. It followed Assyria and it rose to great heights at the time. In fact, at its peak, it looked like it would be around for a long, long time, but it fell quickly and it surprised a lot of people. In the book of Isaiah, the promise was made that a king would come called Cyrus, who as God's anointed would free his people. You see, the tentacles of Babylon had reached out to Palestine, to Israel, to Judah, and had taken into captivity the people that were God's people. Daniel and his companions, for instance, and now they're in captivity. And the promise had been that there would be a return, that they would be freed. And then Cyrus appeared on the horizon. Cyrus was king of the Persians. He went to other places, first of all, in preparation for the final conquest of Babylon. And when he got there, it seemed like the strangest of things because the civil engineers of the army were out there digging this big hole in the desert. Who needs a hole in the desert? What a waste of time. What a distraction. The plan was that the mighty Euphrates River would be diverted, would flow on, and then the gates that were down into the city would be exposed, and nobody had thought to protect that area. Cyrus knew that that was the vulnerability, and the army marched in in essentially a bloodless coup. They took over, and this peaceful nation came. Here we have a clear fulfillment of prophecy and a prediction in the book of Revelation that once again, Babylon will fall. Hmm. Okay. So here you see that uh, 
This ancient story of Babylon has a number of elements uh, which are agreed to both in the Old Testament, also in some ancient historians. So the book of Revelation is building on that story. If you know the story of Babylon's fall uh, way back about 2,500 years ago, then you will have the, the, the bricks, the tools to build uh, an understanding of your story of Revelation. You see, there's a lot of difficult things in the book of Revelation and uh, many things we don't understand, but there's also a lot of things we do understand. Mm. And uh, if you have the background, if you go to that background, build it for yourself, you can understand a lot more than you would expect. Now, the first element in Revelation 16, 12 is the Euphrates River. Clearly in the Old Testament story, it's a literal river, it's there, geographical, it's still going on in the Middle East. Is that what the book of Revelation is talking about? We'll find out in chapter 17. Go to Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1. There it says, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. Here you have one of the seven angels with the seven bowls. Chapter 17 is going to unpack one of the seven bowl plagues. Which one? It's a plague that has to do with water. Mm -hmm. That's plagues two, three, and six. Mm -hmm. Which of these three is involved? You find out if you go to verse five of chapter 17. There it says, this title was written on her forward forehead. This is the woman of verse one. The title on her forehead is Mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. There's a lot of things in there we won't deal with right now, but her name is Babylon. Babylon sits on many waters. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, many waters was often used as a symbol of the Euphrates River. So we're seeing that the sixth plague is being explained in chapter 17. Now we go to verse 15. The angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. Here he's defining the Euphrates River. The waters you saw back in verse 1 that Babylon is sitting on, that Euphrates represents people, languages, nations. It's the political powers, the civil powers of the world. Mm -hmm. So in the end of time, the literal symbol of Euphrates becomes something much bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay, worldwide. Mm -hmm. worldwide. And there is an Old Testament background to what we're reading now. And this Old Testament background goes back, of course, to the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 50 to 51, Isaiah 44 to 47, and Daniel chapter 5, which talks about the last night of Babylon. Mm -hmm. This is the language being used. The last night of Babylon is used to describe the end of the world, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The language being used. All right, so let's look at the Old Testament background now, mm -hmm. and we'll look at Jeremiah chapter 50 and verses 33 to 38. This is what the Lord Almighty says. The people of Israel are oppressed, and the people of Judah as well. All their captors hold them fast, refusing to let them go. Yet their Redeemer is strong. The Lord Almighty is His name. He will vigorously defend their cause so that he may bring rest to their land, but unrest to those who live in Babylon. A sword against the Babylonians, declares the Lord, against those who live in Babylon and against her officials and wise men. A sword against her false prophets, they will become fools. A sword against her warriors, they will become filled with terror. A sword against her horses and chariots and all the foreigners in her ranks, and they will become women. A sword against her treasures, they will be plundered. A drought on her waters, they will dry up, for it is a land of idols, idols that will go mad with terror. Mm. You know, well, Graham, let me point <laughs> something out here. There's a whole series of elements in this text they are all resources of Babylon. Mm. Her wealth, her leaders, uh, her, uh, her soldiers, her chariots, etc. And then the Euphrates River. Right. The Euphrates River is part of the defenses of Babylon, the moat around the city. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a symbol of all the resources that make Babylon strong. Mm -hmm. That's what's picked up in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. 
We'll come back to that later. Sure, okay. We're just giving the Old Testament background yeah. for what is happening in the book of Revelation. The language, the words are used coming right. from these books. So let's come across and we will look now at Isaiah chapter 44, verses 24 to 28. And here is more Old Testament background to what we are actually saying. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who foils the signs of false prophets, who makes fools of diviners, who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense, who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited, of the towns of Judah, they shall be built. Of their ruins, I will restore them. Who says to the waters deep, be dry, and I will dry up your streams. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. He will accomplish all that I please. He says of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. And chapter 45, verse one, this is what the Lord says, to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. Mm -hmm. So Cyrus here is called God's anointed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? That's right. Like and the purpose of this drying up of the Euphrates is to deliver the people of God and rebuild Jerusalem. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Cyrus is an interesting character, yeah. uh, very skilled general. Let's, let's learn a little bit more about that on site. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Yeah. When Cyrus came before the walls of Babylon in 539 BC, he saw these great towering walls which seemed to be insurmountable. The people inside had a tremendous amount of food. They demonstrated this by throwing some over before him. They had adequate water. How could the man take the city? One night, Cyrus surprised them. He actually diverted the waters of the river Euphrates to create a riverbed because the river ran through the city. And through that uh, riverbed, he was able to march his troops and surprise the Babylonians. And that same night, Babylon itself fell. Cyrus was an amazingly brilliant general, wasn't he? A little bit before the fall of Babylon, uh, he practiced for it by invading the kingdom of Lydia which was centered in Sardis that you see behind me. And Croesus, he uh, took his army across the Halys River and attempted to stop Cyrus there. And Cyrus was aware that horses tend to be afraid of camels. Uh, they, the smell of the camel and the look of the camel just scares horses. And so Cyrus dismounted his cavalry, got the camels from the baggage handlers and put his cavalry on camels and went charging toward the Lydian army. And the horses of the Lydian army just absolutely panicked when they, when they saw these camels coming and they took off. And the army of Lydia, Lydia, just seeing this, they panicked and they ran too. So the Lydian army went all the way back here to the citadel that you see up there. Notice how amazingly steep it was. And Cyrus again is looking at an insurmountable obstacle. How do you get up there? He offered a reward. He says, the first soldier who will tell me how to get up there and attack the city uh, will get a big reward. Well, that night, one of the Lydian soldiers way up on the top of that cliff lost control of his helmet and it went sailing down the cliff into the valley below. Unwisely, he decided he wanted to retrieve the helmet. And so he made his way down, picked his way across that cliff, and he, of course, knew about that got his helmet, went back up. One of Cyrus's soldiers was watching all of this, and he later on took a band of men and taught them how to work their way up the cliff, and they came to the top, and guess what? Nobody was guarding, because they thought it was impossible to climb that wall. And so Lydia fell, so to speak, without a shot, because the guards were not there. So you see uh, Cyrus, an interesting character, yet he's a character marked in the Bible. He's marked in the book of Isaiah, 
prophesied ahead of time mm -hmm. some of the things that God would enable them to do. Mm -hmm. And then here in the book of Revelation becomes very significant. If you want to understand the last battle of the book of Revelation, you have to understand the original fall of Babylon. Because in the original fall of Babylon, an attacker comes from the east, Cyrus. He dries up the river Euphrates. Why? So his soldiers can march under the wall and conquer Babylon. Then what he does is he releases God's people who were prisoners in Babylon, allows them to go back to their homeland and rebuild the city of Jerusalem that had been destroyed uh, some 50 or more years before. That basic story is the substory of the book of Revelation here. And end time Cyrus, Jesus Christ, dries up the end time Euphrates River, the political powers of the world, in order to conquer Babylon, a worldwide religious collaboration. And when that happens, God's people are freed. And the end result in the book of uh, Revelation is that there is a new Jerusalem. Now, I mentioned the kings of the East. Throughout the New Testament, East has two meanings, basically. It can be a direction, but otherwise it talks about Jesus Christ. It's the place from which Jesus comes. East is the place where God is doing his work. The kings from the east may be a difficult symbol to understand, except in this context, they are Christ and the armies that are with him. Is this battle primarily literal or is it spiritual? Revelation 16, 15, one last time. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. The end time battle, the battle of Armageddon, is a spiritual battle. It is a battle for the mind. And that's where I want to start again when we return from the break, a battle for the mind. Welcome back. We're talking about Armageddon, one of the most exciting and interesting topics in the Bible. But the big surprise, we're beginning to see it. Chapter 16, 15 is very clear that the battle of Armageddon is actually a battle for the mind and heart of human beings and for our response to God. Now this is underlined when you look at other military texts in the New Testament. Never are these military texts focused on real battles. They are rather concerned with the spiritual warfare, the kind of battles that go on uh, in our minds, as we learned in an earlier program. So uh, the key, perhaps the best text to illustrate this is 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5. It's a military text and perhaps the clearest description of what Armageddon is all about. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Different kind of war. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. What are the weapons of the world? Things like AK-47 rifles and uh, M1, A1 tanks. So these are weapons of the world. The spiritual battle is different. The New Testament battle is different. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Verse 5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You see, Graham, the military language applies to spiritual issues. Mm. It's a battle for the mind. Uh, the kind of battles that go on in our head, as Pamela brought out uh, in an earlier segment, mm. that is what this is all about. Mm. If you read the book of Revelation as liter literal military language, you will misunderstand mm. its purpose. As a result, what we have begun to discover is that the world will come to the place where there'll be three great worldwide confederacies. One of these would be a confederacy of what Revelation calls the saints or the remnant. 
These are those people who are faithful to God, those people who are taking captive their thoughts, who are being faithful to God. A second worldwide confederacy will be a confederacy of institutional religion. Now, this confederacy will be all those religions that have uh, involved with political, economic issues will find their interests will unite together. There'll be a worldwide union, not present today. This is what Revelation is pointing forward to. The third will be a worldwide unity of political, military power. Babylon is the representative of the religious institutions. Euphrates is the representative of the political powers of the world. The saints, the remnant, represent God's faithful people. Graham, take us through the verses that lead up to the Battle of Armageddon. Okay, well, Revelation chapter 16, verse 12 says, The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And so this would be a way of describing, we would say, the coming of Jesus, who comes from the east, leading the armies of heaven. Mm -hmm. And the drying up the river Euphrates really is a withdrawal of support, as you have shown from chapter 17 already. When people realize that they have been deceived, they withdraw their support from Babylon. And so in this sense, Babylon falls, the drying up the river so Euphrates. You could say if Babylon represents worldwide religious authority, mm. it's the political powers of the world, the Euphrates River, mm. that provide the support mm. for that worldwide government, if you wish, sure. at the end of time. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. And now our next verse is Revelation chapter 16 and verse 13. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So here we're dealing with this counterfeit, you might say, of the three angels' messages. This is the uh, unholy trinity. Ah. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that what binds them together is unclean spirits like frogs uh -huh. coming out of their mouth. Uh -huh. And here again we see a reference back to the Egyptian plagues. Uh -huh. And up till that now, the Pharaoh's magicians and sorcerers were counterfeiting the miracles that Moses was bringing, but the frogs was the very last time they were able to counterfeit what God was doing through Moses. Uh -huh. And maybe the Bible is telling us that now this is Satan's last sling. He's been deceiving people with his evil angels, uh, but now frogs are mentioned probably with a purpose, probably with a purpose. This is his last fling. So that's Revelation 16 and verse 13. And uh, we read now our next one, verse 14, Revelation 16 and verse 14 starts to build more so again. And here we have in Revelation 16 and verse 14, this final deception. For they are the spirits of demons performing miraculous signs. And they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle of that great day of God Almighty. You know, John, when you think of all the speculation about Armageddon and all the times people have said World War I, you know, World War II, mm -hmm. what brings about the Armageddon is demonic forces. Mm -hmm. We're looking for supernatural powers that bring them all together. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be a human being. It's going to be something demonic, isn't it? Yeah. Far bigger than just what we see in everyday life. This mm -hmm. is the build-up that is actually taking place and uh, l eventually leads to a setting up of the image, a unity of religion with secular powers. It, it, we're looking for miraculous powers to bring this about at the end of time. And I think what you also have in this passage is an echo of the earlier unholy trinity, mm -hmm. the dragon, the beast, the false prophet. Sure. I think we should ask Bill Johnson to review just very briefly what that was all about. Okay. Revelation chapter 13 is one scary chapter. You see three amazing beasts come out of this chapter. They're ugly, they're fierce, they're crazy beasts. One is a dragon, one is, uh, has multiple heads, and comes out of the sea, and then another one comes out of the land. These beasts are very powerful. But as you read this, this chapter, you realize it's not just political power, it's about religion, because worship is involved with each of these beasts. The dragon wants the world to worship him. The beast out of the sea, he's involved in worship. Then the beast out of the land. When we look at these three beasts, we begin to see an amazing similarity, sort of like a parody 
of God himself. Just as God is a trinity, so these three beasts are the satanic trinity. They demand worship. They oppose God. They oppose the tabernacle of God. It is Satan's confederacy of evil opposed to the people of God. This is the interesting thing. At the end of time, the book of Revelation predicts there'll be a worldwide unity of religion, uh, no doubt brought together with good intentions, that will actually find itself fighting against God. That is what is called Babylon, worldwide confederacy of religion. Uh, the key issues in this final battle, as we have mentioned, are in verse 15. Up until this point, you could get the impression that the Battle of Armageddon is all about uh, military stuff, about gathering armies and, and kings of the earth and so forth. But verse 15 leaves us with no doubt. It says, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. I'd appreciate if we could hold that text up there just a little bit further because it is filled with little statements that remind us of earlier passages in the New Testament. Behold, I come like a thief. That's a, re a representation of Jesus coming. Blessed is he who stays awake. Jesus often said as you approach the end, stay awake. Keeps his clothes with him so he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. That reminds us of Laodicea. Mm. God's final church needs to be wary of uh, being exposed in this way, uh, people seeing that nakedness, seeing that shame. What all of these texts are, you find texts from Paul, texts from Jesus, texts from Revelation, all of these are about spiritual preparation for the end of time. If you read verse 14 and then verse 16, you'd think that fits perfectly together. Mm -hmm. This verse 15 kind of drops in there like it's out of place. In fact, one commentator even said it was put in there by a stupid editor <laughs> after John was gone. <laughs> he couldn't understand why it was there. But the reason it's there is because in the New Testament, military language is always pointing you to spiritual realities. Yeah. And uh, because of that, what this is all about, the Battle of Armageddon is one side of the equation is going to be preparing for the second coming of Jesus, is going to be growing closer and closer to God, is going to be making daily decisions that will foster spiritual growth and relationship with God. The other side is going to be focusing more and more on the temporal issues, political power, uh, economic wealth, etc. And uh, religion very often becomes self-centered, self promoting. We become more interested in promoting our institution, our religion, than we are in promoting the interests of God. Mm -hmm. And it is in these contexts of a, a split between the faithful people of God and the institutions that they had once been loyal to. That is a fundamental part of the Battle of Armageddon. It is pulling apart people. It, it will, in a sense, divide every church and every religion. Mm -hmm. between those who remain faithful to God and those who see their temporal interests as more important. That's what the Battle of Armageddon is all about. Okay, very interesting. So really what you said is that we're learning more about Jesus here mm -hmm. and how we can keep our trust in Him. We're That's seeing right. Him revealed in the Gospel. Yeah. That's what Revelation is all about. Mm -hmm. All right, now let's have a look at our next text, Revelation chapter 16 and verse 16, the only place in the Bible where Armageddon is mentioned. Mm. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. This is the place a lot of people have been waiting for, mm. Armageddon. Mm. There's no place on earth named Armageddon. So what does that mean? Mm. Well, if you break it down, it's a Hebrew concept. And in Hebrew, the word har is actually an H sound in the Greek that, that you miss in translation. The Hebrew word har means mountain. This is mountain of Megiddo. But there's no mountain in the world named Megiddo. But if you go to Megiddo, and I know you have, mm. and you look up, there's a mountain that towers over the city. It's called Mount Carmel. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's go to Megiddo and Mount Carmel. All right, our first picture shows you Megiddo as it has been restored, and it is just a hill, John, mm -hmm. just a hill. All right, our next picture here now shows you the plain overlooking uh, Megiddo, Esdralen, and many battles have been fought there over the centuries, but nearby we see the Carmel Range 
up here we're looking down upon the Esdralin, the plain below from Mount Carmel and our next picture will also show us a view of the plain from up here. This is the mountain near Megiddo or mm -hmm. overlooking Megiddo, the Carmelite range and also we find is here we have this is where a very important Bible event took place back in the Old Testament. Here is where Elijah called down fire from heaven to show who was the true God which mm. will be counterfeited by the Antichrist powers Babylon at the end of time. All right, our next picture shows Baal. Baal was the God who was opposing the true God, the Creator, but he was shown to be a false God in the end and the Creator won at this battle. All right, the next picture shows how at the end of time, this will be repeated, where multitudes of people described as like the river Euphrates, mm. powers are supporting this Babylon, but in the end she will fall, she'll be defeated. All right, that's it in a nutshell, and we're going to go to our break now and carry on after the break. Welcome back. Uh, we're moving into the seventh of the seven plagues here in Revelation chapter 16. But before we do, let me underline just a little bit more of some of the things Graham and I were talking about just before. The Battle of Armageddon ultimately is a replay of an earlier battle in that same geographical location. Megiddo is a city at the edge of a valley and it, towering over it is a mountain called Carmel. In fact, the highest point on that whole mountain ridge is the very spot where likely an earlier event took place. You see, Israel had been faithful to God for part of its existence, but now had wandered away and had become confused between God and Baal. Baal was a Canaanite deity that most of the people began to worship. And finally, the prophet Elijah, thinking he was the only one, was moved by God to lay out a challenge it says, gather the whole nation on top of Mount Carmel, or at least representatives, I suspect, have all the priests of Baal build an altar. Elijah would build another altar. The challenge was out. Okay, you've got two claims to be God, Baal and Yahweh, uh, the true God of Israel. Which one of these is the real God? He will answer by fire. And so the priests of Baal pray, all day long, nothing happens. Blue sky, nothing takes place. When Elijah prays, instantly fire comes down from heaven, burns up the sacrifice, burns up the altar and everything, and everybody realizes the real God is the God of Israel, not Baal, the God of the Canaanites. In the book of Revelation, that is another backstory the Cyrus, the fall of Babylon is one backstory. Another backstory to what's happening in Revelation is the story of Mount Carmel, except for this, Graham. In chapter 13, which prophet brings down fire from heaven? Mm -hmm. It's the false prophet. It's the false prophet. Mm -hmm. It's the beast from the earth. Folk, this is serious business. In the final crisis of Earth's history, there'll be a replay of the Mount Carmel showdown. Once again, there'll be two candidates for being the God that we should follow, the true trinity, the counterfeit trinity, one sending three angels, the other sending three frogs, the spirits of demons. In that showdown, once again, it'll be a power showdown, but this time the fire will fall on the wrong altar. Your eyes, your ears will deceive you at that time. The only safety will be in the two things we've talked about before, in knowing the Word of God, being true to the Word of God, and true to our conscience, God moving upon our hearts. That's what the Battle of Armageddon is all about. And it's very important, I think, that we engage in that battle, even now. The seven last plagues end with the seventh plague, which is found in chapter 16, verses 17 through 21. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. 
No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on the earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones about a hundred pounds each fell upon men and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. So here we see in these texts the great final destruction. Mention of the temple means that God is still in control. As everything is falling apart on this earth, God is still in control. But the earthquake makes it clear the whole world order is coming apart. The battle of Armageddon is now over. The earth is just coming apart. Mm -hmm. Jesus is coming back. Mm -hmm. I want to particularly point out though that Babylon, the great city, splits into three parts. Mm -hmm. What are those parts, Graham? Yeah, we've seen that unity take place mm -hmm. under the verses going beforehand, the unclean spirits like frogs coming yeah. out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. Mm -hmm. They weld this Babylon together in its final phase, which is the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. But then of course, when the city breaks up into three parts, Babylon mm -hmm. falls. Yeah, that's why we would say Babylon is the dragon, the beast and the false prophet because the final plague has a city breaking into three. This is why Babylon then is a union of all the spiritual religious powers in the world. Mm. And they are united, these institutions, in the service of Satan, in the service of worldly ends. Miracles, demonic yeah. powers. Perhaps many of them don't even realize that, not until the plagues. Mm. But it is simply worldly choices, uh, choices of self. All of these pile up until finally people reach a state from which there is no turning back. Sure. Finally then, uh, we see Babylon splitting apart, comes apart, and then God finishes the job. Mm -hmm. Now, chapters 17 and 18 continue to take up the story of Armageddon, continue to take up the fall of Babylon. There's a lot more detail there that we're going to come to understand. But for right now, what John has done is take us to the end of the story, the sixth and seventh plagues. We've now seen how it all turns out. We now see who is the winning side and who is the losing side. Mm. In chapter 17, he goes back over the same ground and now gives a lot more detail. And that's where we'll go in a future program. But for now, we need to take a break and then we'll join Pamela in the other place. And there we will talk a little bit more about this. Welcome back. Uh, we've been talking about the Battle of Armageddon and, and in this segment we want to explore perhaps uh, a little bit more of how that might affect our lives. Pamela, you've been thinking about this. Yeah, I want to ask how do we get ready for Armageddon in a practical sense? And then with that knowledge, um, what difference does that knowledge make? Yeah. So when you listen to the book of Revelation, you sometimes feel like it's way out here and not very practical? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, I think, one of the reasons we're, we're doing this series. And, of course, Graham would invite you, you know, watch the whole series mm -hmm. and then maybe that will help a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> it'll fall, it'll fall <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think in a very real sense, I, I think uh, it's all about the stuff we do every day. Uh, the Battle of Armageddon uh, shows the outcome that where people end up. But I think where you end up then will be decided now. We don't know when the Battle of Armageddon is coming, but if it comes within our lifetimes, we are preparing for it right now. We're in it right now. Uh, the outcome is made up of a whole lot of small decisions, little things that come. Uh, I'm reading a book right now that basically says, don't expect anyone else to trust you if you can't trust yourself. Hmm. Now, what does that mean? Well, I don't trust myself when I decide to get up at five in the morning and when five o'clock comes, I say, oh, I don't feel like it. I'm just going to sleep in a little bit. You see, um, I don't trust myself when I break my promises to myself. 
Hmm. A lot of people try to be trustworthy out there, but inside we're not keeping our own promises to ourselves. So it's that integrity. It's, it's that every little decision is focused on that which matters the most. Those little choices that you make, you know, just in deciding uh, how you're going to operate your day, those are very, very important decisions. It's not less important uh, than what a scholar is doing over in his library. So the little decisions we make every day, I think, are crucial. Armageddon is not intended to have us focused on some big thing out there. It's to motivate us right now, right here. This little choice I have to make right now has eternal significance, has That's universal implications. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. You see? So what you do day by day in the kitchen, what you do in the garden, those choices, those decisions are preparing you for bigger ones later on. Mm. Graham, does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. And I think, John, what you said is in harmony of Revelation 12 and verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives so much as to shrink from death. And I think this is part of Armageddon. We give our lives to Jesus. We receive his righteousness because, in a sense, he has won the battle. There's no way that evil forces are going to win this one. Jesus yeah. defeated them on Calvary. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I interrupt just, just a sec? Because I think we've heard that Pamela has gone through some difficult experiences in the past. Oh, yeah. In a real sense, she's been making little decisions lifelong that have brought her to a much better place than she was before. And you stay on that course. That's what Armageddon's all about. Yeah, it does. Yeah. But I think what helps her to stay on course is the moment, moment she comes to Jesus, she accepts his victory. Uh -huh. God isn't condemning her. She, he sees exactly. her as yeah. if she were his own son. Mm -hmm. That renews your courage all the time. You're mm -hmm. clothed with that mm -hmm. garment that Armageddon is talking about. And then as a result of this, in gratitude to God, you, you live a life of obedience to his commandments. And this spills over, the love of God spills over to how we relate to other people. Mm -hmm. And so you are, by the way you live your life, demonstrating that you believe that God is right and the powers of evil Lucifer is wrong. The little kind deeds that you do each day of your life, the time you sacrifice for Jesus. And I would say this to our viewers, you know, we are part of Armageddon. And in a sense, this battle is lived out in my life and your life. Uh, in one of our brochures, we have a picture of a, a woman caring for an orphan. Mm. And, this, and someone said, what's this got to do with Armageddon? It has a lot to do with Armageddon because God looks upon these people as his army. And we are showing that God is right and fair and just by trusting him. Mm. And you receive your encouragement. God is not condemning you. You're in Christ. You've got that covering. And this spills over to good deeds. And so I would challenge our, our viewers to, to take the text seriously. Make sure you have a right relationship with Jesus. You have that covering. And this will spill over in the deeds of your life every day. Well, coming up next is a very fascinating program. We go to John sees a woman riding a beast and he is astonished. Revelation chapter 17. We thank you for meeting with us this time and we look forward to you meeting with you again in our next program. If you've enjoyed this presentation on the book of Revelation and would like more information, visit www.revelationhope.com. You can purchase your own DVD set of this series or the booklets which cover the content of each program. 